Hey guys, Crash Thompson here. Um, truth be told, it hasn't been a great couple of weeks for me. I don't think it's been very rosy for most of us, actually. I mean, uh, without getting into specifics, things have been kind of crazy within the past few months. Hell, this past year has just been one crazy, tragic thing after another, and... You know, people have come out and said and done better things to help us ease our minds, to help us relieve some tension, to help us relax in these chaotic times. And uh, many others have said and done things far better than I could possibly hope, but I feel like I should do something, something to help alleviate all this stress, something to help remind us that hope is real, that the good in humanity is real, and most importantly, to remind us that love is real. I present to you fine people the latest by doctor, author, all-American hero, Chuck Tingle. Hard for Hardwick, pounded in the butt, by the physical manifestation of my own handsome late-night comedy show. A reading. If there's one thing I've learned after all these years in the entertainment industry, it's that you can never stop moving. Fortunately for me, being on the move is where I feel the most comfortable. A shark swimming through the dark waters of late-night television. Some entertainers are perfectly fine just wearing one hat. Comedian, singer, actor. (laughs) But not me. After starting out as the co-host of the successful game show Tingled Out, I eventually went on to build a media empire around my love of all things poundable. This was the genius for my podcast, The Poundist, as well as my walking head roundup show, Talking Head. While most people would already say that's too much for one man to worry about, I'm still craving more and happily accepted the position as host of the late-night game show Around Midnight, the time that most poundings take place. Yes, I'll admit that my schedule is full, but I'll be damned if I'm not happier than I've ever been. This type of on-the-go lifestyle is where I thrive, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Of course, that doesn't mean things don't get complicated every once in a while. With all this diving back and forth across the traffic-covered city of Los Angeles, I often find myself at the right studio at the wrong time, or vice versa. I try to keep an up-to-date calendar, but there's always going to be something that falls through the cracks. I'm on my way to one such event when my car phone rings, filling the vehicle with a familiar buzz. It's my manager, Corcon Schlobo. I press a button on the dash of my car to talk, then immediately dive right in. Hey, sorry I'm late, I tell him desperately. I forgot we were recording the new Poundist podcast at Butt Melt. I was headed to the other side of the studio and I had to turn around and now I'm stuck in traffic. Butt Melt is a comic shop here in Hollywood that is often the host to some of our live podcasts, but not all of them. For some reason, i totally forgotten that today we were recording a live episode. Now I'm already running half an hour behind. So you're on your way, my manager asks me. Yeah, traffic has literally stopped, though, I explain, gazing out the windshield before me at what appears to be a never-ending stream of frozen vehicles. From here, it looks like I might as well be sitting in a parking lot. All right, man, Corkin replies. Well, while I've got you, do you have time for some questions? I don't have anything else to do, I say, watching as a motorcycle whips past me between the lanes. He's going terrifyingly fast, but in my current position, I have nothing but envy for him. I absolutely hate being stuck in one place. Have you gone over the prep questions for tomorrow's talking head, Corkin questions? There's still a lot of stuff here. Yep, I assure him. I've got it. What else? Corkin hesitates for a moment, the line going silent as he struggles with whatever he's about to say next. What else? I repeat, slightly confused. We need to talk about this guy who's been trying to be a guest on the podcast, continues Corkin. He says his name's Matt Itnight. He says he's known you for a while now, but he wants to get with you for a one-on-one talk. Yeah, I know the dude. I sigh, rolling my eyes. And the answer's still no. I have no idea who this person is. He seems to know you, counters my manager. He knows everything about almost midnight, at least. 
He's even got information on the guests before it airs. He knows the jokes we've prepped. He even knows all the writers by name. Even Mike G, I ask? Or Garrison T? Well, Garrison's a researcher, not a writer, Corkin confirms, but yes. Well, that's a little creepy, I continue. I'm not saying you should have him on the podcast, my manager continues. I mean, it's not like the guy is a high-profile guest or something. I'm just wondering what you think we should do about it. Should I be worried about him, I ask? He seems harmless, replies Corkin. Just wants to talk with you one-on-one. He needs your undivided attention for some reason. See, that doesn't seem harmless, I joke. That's terrifying. Now my manager is laughing, too. All right, all right, I'll stop bothering you about this guy. Suddenly, by some miracle, the traffic around me begins to move again, slowly shifting forward in a beautiful wave that fills me with utter relief. It's moving now, I tell Corkin. I'll be there soon. I hang up the phone and focus on the road once again. The thing about traffic in Los Angeles is that it's completely unpredictable. Sure, you can just assume that it'll take you an hour to get anywhere in the city, but sometimes, even in your darkest moments, the lights will all turn green and you'll get where you need to be going. After the brutal gridlocked standstill, it's shocking how quickly I get myself into butt milk comics. I pull into a spot around back and hop out of my car, grabbing my bag and taking off as quickly as I can down the back alley of the building. From here, I can get inside easily, as long as the back door is unlocked. And at first, I think this is the biggest of my worries until I round a corner and find myself greeted by a strange figure in a long, dark robe. Chris, the hooded figure says. Chris Hardwick. I freeze, immediately thinking back to my conversation in the car. Can I help you? I ask, trying to keep my cool. I'm kind of in a hurry. You're always in a hurry, the hooded figure tells me. I just want to talk to you a bit, one-on-one. I glance down the alley a little further and see that the back door of Buttmelt Comics has been propped open for me. Sweet relief overwhelms my senses as I realize that, regardless of how awkward this is, there's a way out. I'm sorry, I say, stepping around the hooded figure and jogging towards the back door. I've got somewhere to be. I'm trying not to look behind me, but from the corner of my eye, I can tell that this mysterious man is following. You should have me on the podcast, the figure calls out. Just some nice one-on-one time. Okay, sounds good, I reply, trying my best to feign interest. I reach the door and throw it open, getting myself inside as quickly as possible before slamming it shut behind me. I fall back against its cold, hard surface, breathing heavy as I struggle to collect myself. You're here, one of the production assistants shouts as they notice me. Are you ready to go on? I nod. Ready as I'll ever be. Like I said... I work well when it's crunch time. The live podcast at Butt Melt goes off without a hitch, and soon enough I find myself headed towards the next destination, tonight's live taping of Almost Midnight. There are plenty of other people who would be passed out from exhaustion at this point, but not me. After a quick stop for coffee, I'm just getting started, excited for tonight's show as I pull up into the studio parking lot. There's a gate blocking my path and a small guard's booth off to the left. A familiar guard approaches. Hey there, Mr. Hardwick, the man says. How are you doing this evening? Great, I tell him enthusiastically. Just wanted to let you know that Corcon explained the situation. We've got extra tight security this evening, the guard informs me. Nobody that isn't supposed to be here is getting in or getting out. Thank you, I offer with a smile and a nod. The gate lifts and I pull forward, heading down along the side of a massive soundstage and then parking in my marked spot out front. I exit the vehicle and am happy to find myself completely alone, free from the desperate advances of any kind of strange, mysterious stranger. The stage door is open and I head inside, going straight to makeup so that we can get this thing moving as soon as possible. I notice that there are several studio security guards positioned around the soundstage, stoically watching the proceedings for any kind of unusual behavior. I quickly learn that tonight's three around midnight panelists have already arrived and are on their marks. The studio audience has filed in as well, brimming with excitement as they sit in their chairs and catch tiny glimpses of this behind-the-scene action. I can see the crowd from back here through the cracks in the set, definitely noticing a strange energy in the air. Everything feels tense, not necessarily in a bad way, but in a way that makes me feel as though something truly special could happen this evening. When I'm finally finished with makeup, I stand up from my chair and head over to the side of the stage, where Corkin is waiting for me patiently. We're ready to roll, my manager informs me, briefly taking on the role of producer. No sign of Matt Idnight, I question, half-choking at the absurdity of the situation. 
There's no way anyone is getting in or out of here without us knowing, Corkin informs me. Just focus on having a great show, all right? <laughs> of course, I assure him, slapping him on the shoulder and then heading out into the bright lights of the game show stage. The audience roars as I emerge, a wide smile plastered across my face. Almost immediately, I'm in my element, feeling nothing but comfort as I maneuver through a series of outrageously funny bits. Still, I'd be lying if I didn't say that something feels a little weird. A strange anxiety hanging heavy in the air above us. It's not until I'm halfway through the taping that I notice a hooded figure sitting stoically in the middle of the audience, not laughing or reacting at all to the jokes as they continue to pour forth from me and my panel of comedians. I feel a wave of emotion wash over me as time appears to slow, and it's not long before I realize that this sensation of slowing is more than just a feeling. I look around me, and I suddenly realize that everything has stopped. The entire set frozen in place, as though participating in some kind of trendy online video challenge. The only thing that moves now is the hooded figure, the same one as before who stands up from his spot in the audience and then begins to walk down the steps towards me. What the hell is going on, I stammer, hardly believing my eyes. I'm sorry, the mysterious character says. I don't mean to interrupt, but I figured this was the only way I could actually get your attention. How did you get in here, I question. The mysterious figure continues to creep forward until he's mere feet away, and then stops and slowly removes his hood. Because I was here the whole time. As his disguise is cast away, I gasp in shock, reeling from the unexpected sight before me. I recognize him immediately. The physical manifestation of almost midnight itself, represented by a handsome collection of at symbols floating around in a swirling mist. Within the haze, I can see every episode, past, present, and future, dancing together in smoky blue waves. Oh my god, is all I can say. I've been trying to talk to you, offers the living game show, trying to get you to slow down a bit and enjoy things as they pass by. I do enjoy them, I insist. Fair enough, accepts Matt. But don't you think that even the tiniest bit of quiet time could do you some good? Five minutes, even. I let out a long sigh. You're right. I do have a lot of stuff going on. Podcasts, TV shows, TV shows about other TV shows. And now you're even in a book about a bit on a TV show, Matt adds. I shake my head and let out a long sigh. <sighs> You're right. But what can I do? Let's take five minutes, offers the living comedy program. Let's go for a walk. Right now? I question. I've got a show to do. The two of us suddenly go quiet, realizing the double entendre of what I've said. Our eyes meet and we both chuckle nervously, trying to move on from this awkward moment, but not exactly sure how. Nobody is going anywhere. Matt, the sentient manifestation of my own late-night game show slash talk show hybrid, says, They are me. How do you think I slowed all of this down? I hadn't really thought of it, I admit. This is all pretty new to me. Let's figure it out, then, the show offers. I let out a long sigh and then finally accept. <sighs> okay, sure. My own living television program leads the way walking across the set and through the backstage, and then out into the cool evening air. Outside, the world seems quieter than normal, more relaxed, and I have to admit it's a very pleasant feeling after this long, hectic day. Follow me, Matt Ignite instructs, leading me around to the side of the soundstage. Here in the alleyway, a massive metal ladder has been affixed to the side of the building. It appears to be for maintenance purposes only, a way for workers to clean off the rooftop should the need arise but that doesn't stop Matt from making his ascent. Are you sure we should be going up there, I question? It looks dangerous. Relax, the physically manifested program says, his soothing tone resonating deep within me. I nod and then collect myself and begin to climb the ladder. Soon enough, my own show is helping me up over the ledge of the building, revealing an enormous flat surface that is completely empty. Off in the distance, the California sun is just beginning to set, its orange glow illuminating everything with a pleasant warmth and causing the shadows of palm trees to stretch like long reaching hands across the landscape behind them. Whoa, it's beautiful up here, I stammer, my eyes glued to the incredible sight before me. Sure is, agrees Matt. You've just got to take a moment to notice it. I shoot the living show a quick playful glance at first, wanting to deny his attempt at a lesson, but 
then completely taken off guard by the incredible beauty of his eyes. What is it? Matt asks curiously. I just... I stammer, not quite knowing what to say. I just never noticed how incredible your eyes were. You didn't notice much about me, counters the living sentient television show with confidence. I mean, you hosted me, but you never really saw me. I see you now, I tell him, suddenly flooded with emotion. How about seeing a little more, then, the living manifestation of almost midnight coups? He reaches down and grabs the bottom of his long black robe, and then slowly, seductively, begins to pull it up over the top of his head. I had already known that this swirling mass of guest comedians and at symbols was gorgeous, but now that he's completely exposed, I find myself at a loss for words. The manifestation is perfectly toned from head to toe, his rippling abs shimmering in the light of his own swirling televised broadcast. You like what you see? Matt asks. I nod. I love it. I've never been with a man before, let alone a male manifestation of my own basic cable television program. But in this moment, there is no denying my attraction to the handsome hybrid of talk show, game show, and classic late night variety act. I can't believe you were here all along, I sigh, stepping towards Matt's swirling mass and then wrapping my arms around him. Without hesitation, my own living television show pulls me close and kisses me deeply on the mouth, the moment of passion only emphasized by the blossoming sunset that now explodes in purples and reds behind us. For the first time in quite a while, I actually find great comfort in slowing things down. Instead of rushing on to the next moment, I'm just wishing that I could stay here in the arms of almost midnight forever. Overwhelmed with lust, we quickly begin to explore each other's bodies, frantically running our hands up and down one another's ripped, muscular chest. Oh, Chris Hardwick, the sentient manifestation of innovative comedic broadcasting moans. I've wanted this for so long. The love that floods my veins is potent, but suddenly I'm hit with a wave of something even more powerful. Glorious, blinding lust. Without a second thought, I drop down to my knees before this incredible handsome television program and grasp his rapidly swelling cock as it emerges from the swirling mist. Matt throws his head back and lets out a long, satisfied groan, reeling from my touch as I begin to move my hand slowly up and down the length of his enormous shaft. I can feel him tremble and quake with every pump of my firm grip, and this control arouses me in a way that is brand new and wholly unique. I want him to feel all of the pleasure that I'm capable of providing, to make up for lost time by giving myself away to him in the most depraved ways possible. With this in mind, I open wide and take the living television show's rock-hard dick between my lips. Struggling to fit his substantial girth, I quickly get to work bobbing my head up and down Matt's length, playing with his hanging balls while I swirl my tongue around the base of his shaft. Faster and faster I go until finally I just can't take any more and plunge down as far as I can. Matt Ignite slips deep into my neck, somehow managing to make it past my gag reflex, and then stopping at the hilt, with my face pressed up against his chiseled, TV-ready abs. The television show holds me here for a while, savoring the sensation of being fully consumed as I gaze up at him with passionate, cock-hungry eyes. When I finally run out of air, I pull back with a gasp, struggling to collect myself as spit hangs in long strands between my mouth and the head of Matt's enormous cock. I need you inside of me, I tell the show. I've hosted you with my boyish good looks and quick wit, but now I want to host you with something completely different. My ass. I fall back frantically and begin to remove my clothes, tearing my jacket off over my head and tossing it to the side. My shirt and tie come next, followed by my pants and underwear. It's not long before I find myself completely naked on the roof of the soundstage, the cool evening air tickling across my skin. I turn around and crawl away from my sentient half-hour television program for a moment, rocking my bare ass from side to side as seductively as I can. Do you like what you see here, Iku? Yes, Matt Nidnight groans. I stop crawling and look back over my shoulder at him, then slap my ass playfully, then come and get it. The sentient televised block of entertainment doesn't need to be told twice. Immediately floating up behind me and aligning the head of his rock-hard shaft with the puckered rim of my butthole. He teases me for a moment, playing with the tension of my sealed ass before suddenly thrusting forward in a single powerful swoop. 
I let out a yelp of surprise as my body struggles to adjust to the show's incredible size, his girth stretching me to my absolute limits. I'm bracing myself hard against the flat roof, pushing back against Matt while he plows me ruthlessly from behind. I have to admit, at first, I'm not quite sure what to make of this incredible new sensation. But the longer the living late-night show pumps through me, the more relaxed I become. Soon the sensation flowing through my body is more than just one of relaxation. It's one of deep, powerful pleasure. Fuck me, I scream, now egging him on. Pound me harder, almost midnight. The show does as he's told, picking up the pace a little bit. More with every thrust until he's eventually slamming into me with everything he's got. I reach down between my legs and grab a hold of my hanging cock, beating myself off in time with the powerful slams against my backside. You like that basic cable dick, my own sentient television program demands to know? I fucking love it, I cry. Matt suddenly pulls out of my asshole and grabs me around the waist, hoisting me up so that the two of us are standing now. The muscular show turns me around so that we're facing one another, and then motions for me to jump onto him. I follow his orders. With my legs now wrapped tightly around this handsome, swirling mist of late-night comedy, I can feel him exploring my backside with his hands. Eventually, Matt's enormous rod is perfectly aligned with my asshole once more. Without hesitation, the handsome show drops me down onto his gigantic dick, impaling my body completely across the length of his rod. The sentient manifestation of around midnight picks up exactly where he left off, throttling my butthole with everything he's got as I shriek and moan with pleasure. This time, however, he has the force of gravity on his side, and this makes all the difference. It's not long before I start to tremble and quake with desire yet again, my entire body overwhelmed by the lurking prospect of a prostate orgasm that creeps its way through me. I'm quaking with lustful desire, my muscles clenching and releasing in a powerful series of intensely pleasurable spasms. A mind-blowing orgasm begins to emanate. I'm so close, I tell my own living show. I'm so fucking close to blowing my load. Me too, says the living personification of Almost Midnight. I love you, Chris Hardwick. I fucking love you, I admit. In return, the words feeling absolutely perfect as they cross my wet lips. Come with me, the living television program begs, clearly on the same schedule that I am. I reach down between our muscular bodies and grab a hold of my cock, the swollen shaft just aching to explode. I start to beat myself off again, this time at twice the rate of the pounds against my rear. Oh, fuck, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come, I start to chant, the words spilling out of me over and over again in a blissful erotic mantra. Suddenly, the sensation of orgasm rips through me. I throw my head back and let out a blood-curdling howl that echoes up and down the studio lot from soundstage to soundstage. Pearly white jizz erupts hard from the tip of my dick, splattering across Matt's toned abs as he continues to have his way with me. It's not long before almost midnight is coming as well pushing in deep and then holding in place as his rod erupts with hot, milky semen. I can feel the living television program savoring every moment of this decadent release, his eyes shut tight as I'm filled with pump after pump of his jizz. Eventually, there's just not enough room left in my asshole, and the warm seed comes spilling out from the sides, dripping onto the rooftop below. When Matt finally finishes and pulls out of me, a torrent of semen follows quickly after, splattering everywhere. That was fucking incredible, I tell my handsome game show lover. You can say that again, Matt replies with a smile. Sorry I didn't slow down to appreciate you sooner, I offer. I had no idea what I was missing. It's okay, replies my sentient TV show. You're an amazing man, and I truly believe that you can take on as much or as little as you want to. Just make sure to save a little bit of time for yourself at the end of the day. Five minutes of focus is probably all you need. That seemed like more than five minutes to me, I joke. Fair enough, my living talent show laughs. We stand in silence for a moment, awkwardly waiting to see what the other should say. Should we go down there and get back to work, Mad Midnight finally asks. I shake my head. Let's watch the sunset, just a minute longer. The physical manifestation of around midnight grins. I'd love that, he tells me. This has been a reading of Hard for Hardwick, pounded in the butt by the physical manifestation of my own handsome late-night comedy show. I'm Crash Thompson, and remember, always be good to each other. Good day.